Hello, chart watchers, and welcome to the October 2017 edition of Stock Charts Outlook. You've got Arthur Hill and Tom Bowley on this really nice Saturday morning here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Art, I know you're not in Charlotte, North Carolina. You're in Belgium. What are you? What is it, about five o'clock there? It is. It, it's exactly five o'clock. It's five o'clock somewhere, so I'm the lucky one, huh? It's five o'clock in Belgium. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. so, well, first of all, I want to thank you for joining me this month. I know uh, we got Greg Schnell on vacation. Normally, Greg and I uh, do the uh, uh, this chart um, watchers or stock charts outlook live webinar, um, but uh, really appreciate you coming on in uh, Greg's absence. We love having you. And I know uh, you came on our Market Watchers live show on Wednesday and uh, it was got tremendous response. So I'm really looking forward to your presentation today. Uh, what uh, got any ideas of some of the things you want to talk about today? Yeah, uh, we're going to talk, uh, do some of the major market index ETFs, look at the nine sectors, uh, go into base metals, which are looking very strong. Mm -hmm. and Admitting a few stocks. I think uh, I'm going to let you go first. I'll come in afterwards and uh, I'm, I'm going to take a look at the S&P 500 and some of the under the surface signals that I like to look at to see if the rally appears to be sustainable. So I'll go through that and some of the key industry groups that I like as we go into the fourth quarter here. Actually, we just got into the fourth quarter and historically that is a very bullish time for U.S. equity. So going to be a, an interesting presentation, but I know we got a lot of information to get through, so I'm going to let you go ahead and take the screen and roll with it. Okay, I will do that. I just need uh, one quick second to put on my little green circle, and that makes it a lot easier to follow the mouse cursors when I'm looking at a chart, so you can follow along at home. All right. Are you bullish as we, I mean, I guess maybe just start off with that. Are you still bullish as we head through the fourth quarter? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a trend follower kind of guy. So as long as the trend is up, I'm going to assume that it will continue. Uh, trend in motion stays in motion type deal. Mm -hmm. uh, don't know how long it'll last, how far it will go. Uh, that comes from Dow theory. So I would be bullish. And as you've pointed out, um, in your commentaries, you know, we are coming into the seasonally bullish part of the year. So, you know, we have a combination of a pretty strong uptrend and bullish seasonality. Uh, so that could be powerful. Yeah, you know, I actually um, saw a stat, I think it was yesterday morning or maybe Thursday morning, um, that said that right now we are in the longest period or second longest period without a 3% decline on the S&P 500 in the last 100 years. Um, in 19, I think it was 1995 into 1996, we had 241 consecutive trading days without a 3% pullback in the S&P 500. And I believe right now we are at 235 days. So in just about a week, um, should this rally continue without a 3% pullback, we are going to have the longest uh, such streak in the past 100 years. I thought that was kind of interesting. Sounds like a boring bull market. <laughs> it is. That, and many of them are. Yeah. And, and that could explain uh, the low volume. If people are thinking volumes are low, well, when volatility is low, volume tends to be low. It's when the volatility picks up that the volume will pick up. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the, um, boring and kind of climbing a wall of worry. Yeah. I think the other thing too, that's interesting with volume is that, you know, we talk about share volume, but as prices keep going higher, your dollar volumes, if your volume were to stay the same, your dollar volume is going up. And even if your volumes drop off a little bit, you may still have dollar volume equal to what we had before, possibly higher. That's true. That's true. Very good point. So this uh, first chart here kind of sets the tone for these other charts because I'm going to show these indicators. Uh, actually, just the one at the bottom is the PPO 1040. And at the lower left, you see those settings. You say, well, why'd you put it at zero? 
Well, it's kind of like a, a little bit of a hack here at stock charts. If you go down to that PPO setting and you set it at zero, then you're going to get a histogram. And one of uh, the subscribers here wrote into me with that tip. And so it's a very nice way, I think, to view that histogram. And so basically, when the 10 week EMA, which is the red line, is above the 40 week EMA, which is the green line, then you have an uptrend or the PPO is positive. And you can see that happened in March and it's been positive ever since. You know, that the distance between the two moving averages, EMAs, has narrowed a little bit, but you can see still the 10 week is well above the 40 week. So I'm going to show the PPO in the charts that are going to follow. And when you see the PPO, that's what it's telling you. The 10 week is above the 40 week when the PPO is positive. And so here's that same chart for SPY. And SPY kind of acts as my benchmark for the stock market because, you know, it's covering over 80% of the investable equity universe in the U.S. And so the S&P 500 is the elephant in the room. And if it's in an uptrend, that means that most of the market is in an uptrend. So when we look at this, we can see, you know, the bottom in early 2016 and the PPO turned positive in March. And it's, you know, a surge, consolidation, surge. We had that pullback into the election and then a clear breakout. And there was a pretty sharp surge there after the election. And now we've been going on a more modest pace. So we have this lower trend line and the angle of that trend line marks your rate of ascent with its slope. And, you know, it's not a very steep slope maybe 45 degrees, maybe a little less. And then I drew a parallel trend line above. And you can see if we maintain this kind of ascent, maybe we get a pullback from here. And that's my first support zone to watch, kind of broken resistance turning into support in that 247, 250 area. So if we get a pullback to that area, that would be the first opportunity. We had the NASDAQ 100 ETF hitting a new high this week. So techs are doing just fine. The big techs, there you can see that little consolidation for three to four weeks and then the, the breakout above those highs. So we have a bit of a channel working here possibly, and we're not even at the upper trend line. And Google is on the verge of breaking out uh, to a 52-week high. So that could be powering QQQ higher. And then the indicator window, we have the price relative, QQQ relative to SBY. And, you know, you had a little relative weakness in the summer, and that just edged out to a new high in the price relative. So QQQ is not outperforming like it did earlier in the year, but still, you know, it's holding its own. And then the big event over the last few weeks or several weeks has been small caps. This is IWM, the Russell 2000 small cap ETF. And there's the big surge after the election. And then a slightly upward sloping trading range. And then we broke out of this range with this big surge here. A bit overbought because, you know, you move from, say, 134 to 150 in an eight-week period. So maybe we get a little throwback. And again, I'm using broken resistance to mark a support level. So if we get a throwback, that's where the opportunity might be to partake, of this to partake in this trend at a discount. Now, one of the most interesting things about this surge is there's the price relative comparing IWM to SBY. And so small caps were lagging large caps from December all the way until August or middle of August here. And then that price relative turned up, broke the trend line, broke above the summer highs. And so small caps are starting to outperform. And that's a good sign, I think. Now we look at the nine sector SPDRs. Note that the PPO is now positive for all nine sectors. The PPO for energy just turned positive this week. 
So that means the 10-week EMA is above the 40-week EMA for all nine sectors. All nine sectors are in uptrends, and that supports a bull market. Here's consumer discretionary, and you can see the top holdings, Amazon, there's the gorilla there, 15%, Home Depot, 7.5%. Now, some stocks have been weighing on the consumer discretionary SPDR like Comcast here and Disney and Time Warner and Starbucks. So these ones have been hit pretty hard. And Comcast and Time Warner are, of, co of course, the cable operators. D Disney is, of course, tied to cable as well. So those have been hit pretty hard. But even so, the consumer discretionary SPDR is up near a 52 week high. And I'm just gonna mark resistance because it's an uptrend. So in an uptrend, if we expect it to continue, we expect a move above this summer high. So the trouble starts if we break support here. Here's technology. There's nothing really to say on this chart. I mean, this is one of the most stable uptrends, especially since November. You know, you had these two bearish engulfing patterns, but they turned out to be like a, a falling flag here. And you got the little breakout there in early July. And it hasn't moved, you know, very fast and furious on the upside, but it's still moving higher. There's still more buying pressure than selling pressure here in technology. It's a clear and present uptrend. Hey, Arthur. Yes. Just a question going back to that technology, uh, you showed that Apple is the number one holding in there. And of course, Apple uh, did fall back about 10% the first three or four weeks of September. We went from 165 back to 150 and we're slowly getting it back. But Apple, even though you know we keep setting all-time highs in a lot of the different areas of the market, Apple's still sitting about $8 below its breakout level. So for me, it's kind of interesting because uh, technology continues to rise, even though Apple, which is the giant in the space, has been struggling on a relative basis. Do you make anything of that? Well, it's um, uh, if I look at the trend for Apple, uh, I think I've got it here, as a matter of fact. I don't think Apple's in a downtrend. No, and no, I no. Think a, um, you know, I still see an uptrend here in Apple. Mm -hmm. Um I don't see anything that's, that's changed the trend. So um, I think the other ones are picking up the slack because Intel broke out the 52 week highs. Microsoft set a 52 week high and there's Microsoft. So yeah, um, maybe other things are more interesting than Apple at this stage because of that relative weakness you're talking about. There are other leaders picking up the pace here. Mm -hmm. uh, telephone got hit, but Visa is in a very strong uptrend. So here are financials, XLF. And when I look at a chart, um, the first thing I do is what is the big trend? All right. That immediately establishes my bias. All right. So the big trend is up for financials. So that gives me a bullish bias. And you can see the PPO has been positive since May 2016. And so that means when I see a consolidation, it's a consolidation within an uptrend. So it's a potentially bullish continuation pattern. And we had pullbacks here that resulted in breakouts. And so again, we have a resistance zone that was broken that turns into a support zone. And that's the first level to watch if we get a pullback. But we have a pretty fresh breakout working in financials right now. Industrials, uh, similar picture, you know, this is a sh stronger uptrend than financials because it's steadier, all right? They might not be performing as well on a relative basis as far as the percentage gain is concerned, but, you know, this is a consolidate, breakout, consolidate, breakout, consolidate, breakout, consolidate, breakout, and there's another 52-week high. So, again, this broken resistance turns support. So if we do get a pullback in the next few weeks, then those will be the first areas to watch for that bounce. And I think a pullback would be more of an opportunity than a threat. 
Uh, materials, similar situation as industrials, there might be a connection there, pretty steady uptrend. And again, these are weekly charts going back two years. And then broken resistance, turning support. And here's the one that has finally joined the rest of the crowd. Excuse me for that slippage in my browser there. But this is energy. All right. And energy had the big move up, leader in 2016, and then the laggard for most of 2017, and then got that big move and the breakout. And you can see that reversal happened in that 50 to 62% retracement zone there. So this breakout looks bullish. And we're kind of stalling here. And I've got a resistance level there that turns into support. So, you know, a little throwback to 66 might offer, offer an opportunity. And there you can see the PPO turning positive. You can see that 0 0.077, so barely positive. But hey, it's the end of the week. These are weekly closes. So it has happened. Now, I also was looking at your components there on that one. Uh, are looks like three companies. You got Exxon Mobil, um, Chevron, and Schlumberger making up uh, almost fifty percent. It's that amazing, huh? Yeah. So Exxon Mobil is like twenty three percent. So you definitely need to watch these three if you want to consider an investment or trade in XLE. And if you go back to XLB, look at Dow Dupont twenty three point three percent. Yeah, you're almost investing in Dow Dupont. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, Monsanto is is really doing well, and it's eight percent. Um, so yeah, that's a really good point, though, because I think a lot of folks just look at it. You know, you look at an area and you think you've got wide diversification by getting an ETF, but you really need to look at the components to see the weightings to see if it truly is heavily diversified or not. And you can see some of these are, and some of these are not. Absolutely, because uh, these are large cap sectors, basically, and they're weighted by the large caps. So if you want exposure to large caps, then these sector SPDRs are okay. But yeah, if you want a broad, more diversified exposure, you're going to have to look elsewhere. There's, there are equal weight sector ETFs as well, but they don't trade as much volume. And I think the industrial sector is the only sector where the top 10 components account for less than 50%. They account for about 44% of the ETF. All the other eight sectors, the top 10 components account for more than 50% of the ETF. So healthcare, steady uptrend, breaking out there, and this broken resistance turns support, so it's doing okay right now. Kind of stalled out a little bit the last few weeks, but hasn't broken down by any means. Consumer staples. Now this is the one that's been the weakest over the last few months. So most of the sectors have been moving up. Energy even moved up from August to now, uh, but staples moved down, but there's a lot of support here. And you can see the PPO is positive, even though the 10-week EMA has moved closer to the 40-week EMA. That's why the PPO has declined. And if the 10-week EMA goes below the 40-week, then the PPO will turn negative. All right, but, you know, we had a couple indecisive weeks and a bounce this week led by colgate Palmolive. Uh, the thing about uh, this sector is, and it looks like I got the wrong components there. I'll have to update that because NSC is not part of that, neither is Emerson. Uh, but Colgate-Palmolive had a really good week, but Walgreen, Boot, Walgreen Boots Alliance and CVS got just shellacked. They were hit really hard, so they weighed on the sector, but Walmart is a big component and it helped the sector. Here is the utilities SPDR, and it has an uptrend working here. And I don't see anything. You can see that utilities are very strongly, positively correlated to TLT. So they act as a bond proxy. So when TLT goes up, treasury bonds go up, utilities tend to go up. And I'll have the treasury bond chart in a little bit because we need to cue off of that for our outlook on utilities and gold. 
Now we'll look at a few industry group ETFs. We got metals and mining. And the reason I put this one in here is because I've got base metals coming up and base metals are doing really well, copper, aluminum, nickel, and the base metals ETF. So I think that bodes well for this ETF. And you just had a massive move, 12 to 34, you almost tripled, all right? And then we had a pretty good pullback in percentage terms, but a bit of a rounding bottom there. And it took quite a few months. And then we broke out and we're holding above that breakout so if, as long as we hold above this breakout, I would expect this one to continue higher here. And you can see the PPO starting to turn back up as well. I got a couple questions here for you. Um, sure. Uh, and while you're going through these ETFs, I think these are pretty timely. Um, one question that came in is, um, do you mostly invest in ETFs? Is that, is that what you do uh, personally? Uh, I do a little bit of ETF rotation uh, strategies um, and a handful. Um, I wouldn't like have a portfolio of 20 ETFs. You know, it's going to be quite limited. And I do trade a, a mean reversion strategy using the uh, five major index ETFs, SBY, QQQ, IJR, MDY, and DIA. Okay. Um, if you were looking for you know those stronger ETFs, one question that came in is what's the most efficient way to find those outperformers? In other words, if you were just going in to stock charts right now from scratch and you said, okay, let me find the best performing ETFs. Do you have any um, you know, uh, perfected way or preferred way of finding those ETFs? Well, it's, it's a kind of, um, you know, you can do a, uh, the scooters. Uh, that's a good way to do it. If you go to the free charts page here at Stock Charts, or you can just do your own ranking by an indicator. You can choose rate of change and you can choose three months or six months. I found that that works pretty good as well. Um, here are some summary pages. There are the scooter reports. And by the way, in those scooter rankings, which is um, exclusive here at Stock Charts, rate of change does play a big part in those rankings. Yeah, the six month uh, rate of change does. So if you go to US ETFs, and there you can see there's a ranking of the strongest ETFs according to our scooters. And you can do a little search here. And if I search for XL, you can see that'll weed out a lot of the symbols there. And I've got a lot of the, well, I've got the sector SBDRs because they begin with XL. All right. So we can see according to our scooters, we have materials, technology, finance, and industrials leading as far as these scooter scores are concerned. And since we're on this question, I've got a little scan here that I run and any scan that you run, you're going to be getting the scooter score. So you can put in a scan for the sector SPDRs. And here I've got high, low percent actually shouldn't be winging this, but I will, I'm going to go to this different one and build you a new one. Um, so here are the sector indexes similar situation. And I'm going to rank by the SMA. I'm just going to rank by close. And then you'll see on any scan that you run, you're going to get the scooters. And I need to put in a different chart list. So you can put in a different chart list, any of your chart list. These are my chart list, so you can't put those in. But what I've done is I've created a chart list with the nine sector SBDRs and you click to add that. So you add your chart list and this can be any chart list that you have. And if it's with ETFs or most stocks, because we do run a scooter score for most stocks, there you can see you have the scooter score for the nine sectors. 
And I can rank by that column by clicking it. And again, we see materials, technology, finance, and industrials. They all four have higher scooter scores than SPY. So that tells me they are the leaders. So that's one way to find it. You can go to your chart list, put it in the scan, run that scan, and then you can see the scooter score. Okay, so we're at biotechs now. And I added this little thumbnail. This is a thumbnail from Decision Point that gives you the last four weeks, I believe, or four 20 periods of trading. And the reason I put that there is because we have what's called a dark cloud forming in IBB. Now, this is a short-term pattern. I don't think it's tradable. Uh, I think the tradable part is when it pulls back, maybe into this support zone. Because in an uptrend, I'm only looking for bullish opportunities. All right. So with this dark cloud, we've seen a little bit of selling pressure this week. So if we pull back into this 325, 330 area, that might be an opportunity because we have broken resistance turning into support. And the long-term trend is clearly up. And similar situation for the biotech ETF, the SPDR. You know, a lot of noise happening at the end of 2016, but you had consistently higher lows throughout and a consistent uptrend. And now we had this big surge. And again, broken resistance turns into your first support zone. So if we get a little throwback here, that would be more of an opportunity, I think, than a threat. Now, going to the treasuries, because where they go is going to affect the utilities, SBDR, and gold. In other words, if TLT moves higher, this is the bottom window, I'd expect gold and utilities to move higher. I'll show gold in a minute. But what we're seeing here, we got a big surge in treasuries this week off this support zone. So this trend that's been in play in 2017 is still in play. All right. It's not reversed unless we break 122 here. And for the 10-year yield, it's turned down from this, from these prior highs here, around 24, which is 2.4%. So if yields move lower, that means bonds are going to move higher. Uh, so that would be positive for utilities and gold, but it'd be negative for banks. Something to consider. And here's gold. And at the bottom, I have this correlation coefficient. And that measures the relationship between two symbols. And so when that correlation coefficient is positive, that means they move in the same direction. And you can see, this is a 13-week correlation coefficient, and it's positive for most of the last two years. So that means gold and TLT, the Treasury bond ETF, move in the same direction for the most part. It's just something to enhance your analysis. You don't buy or sell based on it, but it tells you if you're watching gold, you also need to watch TLT, not just the dollar. And we look at gold here, you had that sharp decline, and we have basically a three candlestick reversal going here. The decline, the kind of a hammer day, and then the long white candlestick this week, this past week. So we've reversed at, I'll call this support now at one, 20-ish and be bullish on gold as long as it holds. And base metals. Uh, look at this uptrend here in base metals, DBB. It's about one-third zinc, one-third copper, one-third aluminum. So I would think that would bode well for the metals and mining SPDR at some point. And then you break those down. We don't have zinc because there's not a zinc ETF, but there's copper breaking out in the summer, all right, and turning back up the last two weeks. Aluminum broke out a little after copper did. It's stalling, but still in an uptrend. And then this is nickel. Nickel has just been basing possibly since 2015. All right, had this decline and broke out and then a sharp pullback, but back to the kind of the breakout zone and turned back up sharply this week. 
And I don't know if nickel's tradable because it's probably has pretty low volumes, but this is information that we can use. It tells us that industrial metals are strengthening. And that means maybe we should be looking at stocks that have something to do with industrial metals. And then oil, uh, look at that trading range. This is West Texas Intermediate, the continuous futures contract. It's just been locked between 40 and 55 or 17 months. And below we have Brent locked between 42 and 57. So I'm just watching this upswing here and it's still an upswing. And as long as it's there, then that bodes well for XLE and XES, the um, uh, oil and gas equipment services SBDR. But you know, if oil breaks below, say, 48, then we need to reassess here. And then if Brent breaks below, we'll call it 54, then we need to reassess. So I think I've uh, run my time here. Okay. And I'm going to hand it over to Tom. Yeah, a, a question that came in was uh, your mean reversion strategy. Is there somewhere, um, you know, that people could find, you know, a little bit more about it? Have you written some articles or is there some other place that you could send them to learn a little bit more about that strategy you talked about? Sure. If you're, uh, it's, it's part of the members uh, section of the website. So it's behind the paywall, uh, but there's a little magnifying glass icon at the top right of every web play page. And if you click on that, and if you search system trader, one word, and click enter, then you will be taken to the search results for all the system trader articles that I've written. And these are articles that are with back testing. So I've taken a strategy and I've laid it out and I've back tested it and I've given you the results for this strategy. Uh, there's a whole bunch here. There's a momentum strategy, and there is a mean reversion strategy down here that deals with, there it is, testing a mean reversion system with a chandelier exit. All right, that was done in December 2016. Then I updated it, I believe, in... March 2017. All right, but all these articles are here if you're looking for a particular system to learn about and see how it has worked in the past. Of course, that doesn't guarantee how it'll work in the future, but it does give you a strategy to think about. Okay? All right, awesome. That was a great presentation, Art. I really Thank appreciate you. it. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and take a, a kind of a similar view um, taking a look at the market and, uh, first, you know, there, one of the things I like to do when I'm looking at the market is to see whether or not I think a move to the upside or to the downside is sustainable. And obviously we've been in an uptrend for quite some time. And so the first chart I have here is on the S and P 500. It's just a three year weekly chart and you can see the move in the S and P 500 since early 2016 has been straight up. Um, some of the areas of the market that I like to look at, I always like to check out the aggressive sectors. And uh, Art really laid out some great charts there showing that the technology area, the industrials, and the financials clearly, clearly are in an uptrend. And even consumer discretionary, which has been weak on a relative basis, on an absolute basis has broken out and is still uh, looking okay, even though it has been lagging. Um, I'm going to take a little different approach and just look at some of the relative ratios um, to see whether or not money is moving into aggressive areas of the market. And if it is, it's telling you that the uh, psyche of the trader is that it's, we're in a risk on environment. And that's really what you want to see when the S&P 500 is going higher. If you're watching CNBC, you're just going to see, you know, cheerleading going on when the S&P is setting new highs. But it really is more important to see what's leading that move to the upside. So I like to see the money rotating into aggressive areas. So my favorite relative ratio is just looking at the consumer stocks. Are traders favoring discretionary, which are much more aggressive, or are they favoring the staples, which are much more uh, conservative and safe? Um, because if you think about it, discretionary stocks are really the things that we need. Those companies sell things that, or excuse me, that we want. Discretionary companies sell things that we want. 
you want to get a new car. You might not have to get a new car. You may not need to get a new car, but you might want to get a new car. If you feel good about things, you'll go out and you'll buy that new car. Same thing with house, uh, you know, housing. Um, you know, you might be perfectly content in the house you're in, but if you really feel good, just got a pay raise, your job, you feel secure, you're feeling good about the economy, you might go out and buy that new house. Um, there, so there are different areas of consumer spending. You know, I, I, like, I like to use uh, Starbucks as an example too. Just those types of companies tend to do well when the economy is strong because people are willing to spend their discretionary dollars. When things start to get weak, and you're not feeling good about things and it, you, know, you just kind of get in that more defensive mindset. It's not so much about spending money in the discretionary area. It's more about just buying the things that you absolutely need. You know, you're going to go get your deodorant. You're going to go get your soap. Um, if you're not getting those things, I'm glad that this is you know, online and not live uh, because I wouldn't want to be around anyone who wasn't using those types of things. Those are the things that we absolutely need. So, when you're looking at this ratio, and this is just one ratio, I've had folks talk to me and say, well, you know, what about this period here where the XLY versus the XLP came down? Well, we could look at a longer term chart. And I think what you'll see is that the longer term trend remains positive. You will go through relative periods uh, or relative weak periods within a, an overall uptrend. Money will rotate into other areas of the market. It's just going to happen. But if I'm looking at this objectively. I'm looking at the S&P 500 rising. Here's your discretionary versus staples rising. And the last big move that we've seen here in the S&P 500 last six weeks or so, you can see that there's been a big move up in the XLY versus XLP ratio. So to me, money is rotating into the more aggressive discretionary space. And I think that's very bullish. Some other areas, I like to follow the transports versus the utilities. Normally, in, if the economy is weakening and rates are dropping, that normally means that's normally a good thing for utilities and not so good for transport. So normally in that environment, you'll see the ratio going down. But over the last six weeks, when we've had this big move on the S&P, you can see that this ratio has broken this uh, relative downtrend channel and is, has, looks to me to be pointing higher. Same goes for the Russell 2000 versus the S&P 500. After a huge move up, and by the way, these downtrends, you might say, well, you know, they were in a downtrend. That's not good for the market, but they're following almost parabolic rises. So it takes a period of time when you will see rotation uh, move away, but then ultimately break out again. And I think we're getting these breakouts again to the upside in some key areas. Banks versus the REITs. You can see this also consolidated for a while after a huge move at the end of 2016 and early 2017. Looks like we're just making that breakout. Um, Arthur was talking about the relationship with banks and, and uh, treasury yields and so forth. So forth. Treasury yields need to continue to rise to help support the banks. It would probably be okay if we just consolidate with the yields, but if we get another breakout in the 10-year treasury yield, for instance, above 2.40% where we've struggled in 2017, I think that would be huge for the banks, especially on a relative basis to the REITs. REITs are much like utilities in that they, they tend to carry nice dividends. And they're great alternatives. They're safer plays when the stock market is moving lower. So you see a lot of money rotating into those defensive areas. But when we're in a full-fledged bull market, uh, the tendency is for banks to outperform the REITs. So I like to see this breakout. So what I'm looking at beneath the surface is, I think, improving uh, indications. I, I love these, uh, these moves to the upside and these relative indicators. Uh, the breakouts of some of the uh, consolidation or down channels that we've seen in 2017. I'm just not seeing anything that is uh, that looks really weak to me. So I'm expecting this rally to continue. Now, that's just the overview and some of the under the surface uh, signals. But I'm going to go through and let's take a look at some of these charts. And Art went through a lot of this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But technology what I look at here is your absolute move to the upside in the, in the XLK, and here is your relative move relative to the S&P 500. Technology continues to lead. I know a few weeks ago, I read some uh, different articles about how folks were a little concerned because technology had turned down relative to the S&P and it was lagging. Well, we need a break. I mean, technology is not going to lead every day, every week during an uptrend. But you can see, for the most part, this relative trend continues higher, which tells me that folks are still interested in trading 
the uh, more aggressive technology area. If we go to um, the next chart, this is the industrials. Same thing. Here's your uptrend and here's your relative strength looking to break out again on the XLI relative to the S&P 500. Keep moving. We've got the uh, consumer discretionary. Here's your absolute breakout. So again, I was talking earlier about the fact that the XLY on a relative basis has struggled. And you can see this goes back the last two, a little bit more than two years, where the XLY has just kind of gone along for the ride with the benchmark S&P 500. And even recently, I've kind of highlighted, we've broken down to new relative lows. However, we're, we still look fine on an absolute basis. We're just not going up as fast as the S&P 500, but we're not on a sell signal. And I think that's important to uh, realize. Hey, Tom. Yes. Can you explain a little bit? You're using the ratios for all of these, but the ratio values on the right have different values. Uh, can you explain, is that actual value of meaning or do we just, do we just need to be looking at the line and, and the way it's uh, the direction of the ratio line? Yeah, I, well, personally, I like to follow both. I mean, the one that's most significant is just which way the ratio line is moving. If it's moving higher in general, then the XLF in this case is outperforming the S&P 500. If it's moving lower, like during this period for about three months, the, the financials were lagging the benchmark for a period of three months. But I think it's important to watch the levels too, because in addition to following price support and price resistance, I like to kind of keep an eye on relative support and relative resistance as well. So I had circled this a few months ago. You can see that when we made the big move last uh, November and December, right after the election, financials and industrials took off to the upside. And that move took out prior relative resistance. So I have this line coming across. And yes, for a few months, money did come out of financials. But as you can see on the actual chart, Financials did not break down. They held on to some price support coming across here. Never even moved down to the area of the price breakout at 20. So the XLF still looked fine from an absolute perspective. And it's okay for money to rotate. In fact, that's the hallmark of a bull market is you're not going to have one group leading all the time to the upside. What you want to see is that these groups remain on technical buy signals. Um, and I think you pointed that out perfectly earlier. Arthur, you said that the uh, PPO on all the groups now, even energy, have turned positive where we're seeing the shorter term moving average above the longer term moving average. So if you're not getting technical sell signals on these groups, where is this bear market going to come from? And so, uh, you know, I, I kind of follow things similar to you. I think when we're in an uptrend, um, it's very difficult to get bearish. I don't look for bearish opportunities in an uptrend. I look for bullish opportunities in an uptrend. So, these moves, when you see relative weakness for a period of time, a lot of times that is setting up your um, opportunity on the long side. So I don't frown when I see these, these uh, pullbacks in relative strength and, and in absolute strength. I actually look at those as opportunities to get into some key areas. And I'm going to go through the, uh, some of the industry groups that I like in just a little bit. Okay. So that uh, answered the question. So, I mean, this ratio that's over here, this is just simply dividing the XLF versus the S&P 500. That's an S&P 500 is over 2,500. That's why this ratio is so small. So, I mean, it does have meaning. You are making a calculation. And when this breaks out to new highs, it's telling you that on a relative basis, financials are outperforming. So, if you're in the financial space and say you're in the banks and so forth, you want to see this relative strength move up and clear to new highs. So that's what you should be looking for with the financials. And I think it's going to come down to the, to the Fed. And, you know, Arthur, you and I have had some conversations. Uh, I think we both believe that the bond market actually leads the Fed and kind of predicts what the Fed's going to do. So it's a really good barometer to kind of keep an eye on the treasury market and on the uh, corresponding yields to see whether or not uh, the bond market is pricing in moves by the Fed. I think eventually we're going to get that breakout above 240 on the 10 year treasury yield. And from all accounts, uh, I would not be surprised to see the Fed acting again in 2017. Uh, but that's a, that's a topic for another webinar. Uh, <laughs> okay. Hey, we're going to have one soon. <laughs> yes, we will. <laughs> and it'll be live. <laughs> yes, it will. It'll be another live webinar. 
Um, moving on to the healthcare, I like the healthcare group. I thought that uh, from an absolute standpoint, you can see that we really struggled. We were in a trading range for almost two years. I love to see breakouts after long basing patterns. So I think that the uh, XLV broke out. I think healthcare looks good, particularly the biotechs, which Arthur touched on a little bit ago. And you can see on a relative basis, um, you know, while we were downtrending through 2015 and 2016, that changed early in 2017. And now we've got a relative uptrend. So we're starting to see some leadership from the healthcare space, especially the biotechs. And that's where I've added the biotechs here at the bottom, the DJ USBT relative to the XLV. So what this is telling me is that the XLV is gaining versus the S&P 500. And then within the XLV, biotechs are leading. So you got a strong industry group within a strong sector or strengthening sector. Uh, I'm going to keep rolling here. Consumer staples. Now, this is interesting because we want to see wide participation, which means we want to see groups that remain in a buy signal. I think that the XLP is still holding up fine. We had an uptrend, consolidation, uptrend, consolidation. I think everything still looks good here. But notice on a relative basis, this is not where you want your money. So you want participation from the group, but this is not where you're generally going to make the most money during a bull market. You want to see money rotating to aggressive areas and away from defensive areas like the XLP. So this is beautiful. The, the absolute prices are in a bull market, but the relative strength is down, which is perfect. Yeah, the time to worry is when staples start outperforming the market and utilities start outperforming the market. That's and exactly that right. Yep, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just emphasizing your point. You know, the time to be concerned possibly is if staples start outperforming. Yeah, and you know, the first nine months of 2007, if you go back and look, we saw a lot of these ratios start turning in the nine months leading up to the high in October of 2007. So that is, to me, a major warning sign. When the S&P 500 is going higher, you know, CNBC is going to have their pom-poms out. But if you're seeing strength from consumer staples um, and uh, utilities and healthcare leading that move on a relative basis, that's when I think you want to grow a little bit more concerned about the rally. Yes. Uh, great point. And uh, so here's your utilities. Pretty much the same thing. We got a really nice stair-stepping uptrend in utilities. So money's rotating in and at least we're staying, um, you know, with a, a bullish sign in place here. I think it remains on a buy. Uh, I think these green arrows show you that throughout 2017, every time we pulled back to the rising 20 week moving average, we bounced. So that's perfect. And we also on a relative basis have been for the most part declining on the XLU versus the S&P 500. So again, that's more to uh, the point that Arthur was just making. This is what you want to see. You want to see all the groups on a buy signal, but you want to see the money rotating to the key aggressive areas. And I think this points it out. So I can't get bearish when I see this kind of action. Uh, I know we're overbought. I know there's a lot of reasons people are skeptical. Maybe they've got uh, geopolitical worries. Maybe some of them are worried about the whole political environment. Um, for me, I follow the charts. And I know, Arthur, you do the same thing. We are in an uptrend and I don't see any signs that this uptrend is you know, about to end. Yeah, I mean, overbought is really bullish because overbought means you've got strong buying pressure because you don't become overbought unless you've had strong buying pressure. So you're yeah. right. The momentum is there. And as long yes. as the momentum is there, we're momentum traders. This is what we want to see. <laughs> it's a great, great market environment for me anyway. I, I think this is, uh, you know, until that trend changes. And as you pointed out, some of their support levels earlier, you know, until you start seeing those breakdowns, it's very difficult to do anything but use uh, pullbacks as opportunities. Um, so I've gone through all of the, the sectors that I wanted to go through. I, didn't, I left out materials and energy because for me, they're not as geared toward the psyche of the, the market. I think they kind of have their own uh, things that they work off of, energy with oil prices and, of course, commodities uh, in, the, uh, in that material space. Um, and that can be influenced by a lot of things, geopolitical issues, dollar, interest rates, a uh, number of different things besides just the psyche of the market. So for me, those two groups, I just kind of consider them neutral groups. Um, the four aggressive groups I want to see going higher in a bull market. I do not want to see the defensive groups leading on a relative basis during a bull market. So I think everything is pretty much in play. Now, within the um, 
within the different sectors that I pointed out, there's four aggressive sectors. These are some of the indices, industry groups that I think look particularly interesting. Um, the Dow Jones U.S. Computer Services Index. Here is a move up on the daily chart. You can see these pullbacks have been holding beautifully on the rising 20-day. The uh, daily MACD pointing higher, meaning that that short-term moving average is accelerating away from the longer-term moving average. So we've got momentum on our side. And when you look at this, you might say, well, you know, it was kind of in a downtrend for a while. But actually what I was, what I look at more is the fact that it was more of a wedge. Uh, we had a beautiful move to the upside. I think if you connect these highs and connect the lows, you'd see a wedge. We've broken out of that. And you can see that the weekly MACD is just turning up off of the center line. So I think this is a group, especially on a pullback to maybe the 145 area, uh, I think is a great uh, setup. And I'm looking for it initially to go test this 152, 153 area. But the reason I like it is it's been consolidating for th the last few years, and it's just starting to show some real bullish tendencies. And so these types of moves that are just starting can go on for a long period of time. So this is an area that I would look for potential, uh, maybe some individual stocks within. I trade individual stocks as opposed to ETFs. Uh, I will trade ETFs from time to time, but not very often. Um, mobile telecommunications, you look at this chart and you say, wow, what could you possibly like about this? Uh, the daily chart doesn't look that fascinating, but again, I think if you go to a weekly chart, after moving higher, you can see that the MACD had rolled over. We had a negative divergence. All the way up as we continued pushing, you see that rising 20 period moving average was holding. Negative divergence comes in and all of a sudden that doesn't hold. We sideways consolidate for a while and you've got the MACD that works its way all the way back down to center line support. I like the fact that this last week looked like it was breaking down below 320, which was the low since back in January, but we did reverse out of it. And I think this could be an area, maybe you'd be watching that low from last week, but this is an area where we could see mobile telecommunications begin again to rise off of this uptrend. So if you connect the highs and you connect these lows here, I think you have a wedge or maybe a triangle pattern of some sort, but a breakout to the upside, I think would really signal the next move. So you could either wait and see a move back up above 340, especially 350. Let me take, a, take out that uh, reaction high here that we saw at the beginning of August. I think this is a group that could really move to the upside. Uh, delivery services. This is a group actually that I am trading stocks uh, within. I've got, um, uh, I think it's AAWW, which I'll pull up that chart in a little bit. But here was a big breakout of this prior top. I'm going to pull up the weekly chart here as well. Look at the sideways consolidation here for a couple of years, two and a half years. And then when we finally got the breakout, here's that consolidation that we talked about and another breakout. Now we're holding the rising 20 and we're breaking to the upside again. I think this is a group that's just getting on a run. So I think the delivery services group is one to keep an eye on. Hey, Tom. Yes. Uh, how would you find the stocks that are in, say, the mobile communications group? Okay, well, what you can do is, um, and one of the easy ways for me is from the homepage under your control center here, if you click, you can go into the industry groups, but if you just start with the sectors, sometimes I'll look at the sectors, and if I, I know that it's in the technology group, I can click on that, and here is your mobile telecommunications. Now, if you click on over here, you can get the chart, but if you actually click on the link here, it brings up all the individual stocks within the group. And you can see it's sorted right now by an intraday gains, but you can change this. You, you could change it and say, well, you know, what about the last month? You know, let me look at some that maybe haven't performed as well. And I don't know if I'd be looking at something down 21% in a month, but if you get some of these stocks and I would be looking maybe at the scooter, here's, um, you know, AMX 72 scooter rank, but it's been down 3% in the last month. That might be something that's interesting. Um, and you can it's, see it's one of the higher scooters in the group, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. Um, but it's been weak for the last month, but it looks like it's starting to gain strength. Look at the volume coming in. It could be just starting another uptrend. So that's one way to do it. The other way is to simply click on the scooter um, and, and you can get the um, oh, yeah. stocks within this group sorted by scooter rank. So you can look and say, well, you know, these stocks have really gone up a lot in the last month. But what about something like this, SBAC? It's got a decent scooter rank and it's only up 1% in the last month. Maybe pull that one up and take a look. And you can see it's a nice little cup forming or it looks like maybe a cup, um, you know, and, and check out, this is uh, something that, you know, I know Arthur talks about a lot. I like to buy these stocks on pullbacks. 
I mean, call me crazy, but I like to spend less when I buy a stock. I don't like to spend more. Uh, I mean, doesn't that make sense, Arthur? I'm always looking for a sale. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, have you ever gone into a store and said, you know, I'm going to wait until you raise prices. I'm not buying until you raise prices. Who does that? I and mean, you, you wait for a sale. So look at SBAC. I mean, you have a really nice looking pattern. I don't know, maybe not quite an ascending triangle, but maybe it's a little bit of a cup handle and a breakout. Um, you come all the way back down and this broken level of resistance is your support area. Classic. Great, yeah, it's a great level. And I know there are some that say, well, what? It's gone below the 50-day moving average. Well, sometimes price supports a little bit below the 50-day moving average. But this is where, in my opinion, you get into stocks on pullbacks. And I always talk about reward to risk on a trade. And I know that if I lose that price support, especially with heavy volume, I'm getting out. So I can get into this stock close to 140. I didn't see it at the time. I wish I could tell you that I bought this one. Um, but you know, there are thousands of stocks out there. It's hard to catch them all. But this came back right down to a key support level, held and turned right back up. So if you get into a stock here in an uptrend, your assumption is that the uptrend is going to continue. So if you get in at 140 and you're looking at a target of 154, the recent high, and you have a really tight stop, that is a strong reward to risk trade. And that's what I look for when I'm trying to find individual stocks. But that's just, that's one way that you can use the index. And I get that comment a lot because, you know, when I'm talking about indices, I, I get comments to say, well, you can't buy an index. So what do you do if you like the index? Well, that's how you, that's what you would do. You would go into that sector summary page, um, scroll down, you know, or move into the various uh, uh, sector ETFs. And if it's technology you're looking at, pull up the industry groups within technology and find the charts. And then once you see an index that you like, then you do like I did with mobile telecommunications, you pull up the components and you can sort it by scooter rank. And again, I'm not going to look for ones that have um, been up 15% in the last month. That's just not my style. Um, it's probably a great looking chart and it's probably one that I would want to be interested in on a pullback, but I'm probably not, if I'm looking to buy something that particular day or you know, in the near term, it's probably not one I'd look for. But SBAC looks like a great looking stock. I wouldn't be jumping into it now because, again, you're getting close to resistance. You've moved up near overbought territory. But maybe a pullback down to the moving averages, this little short-term breakout around 147. Maybe that's an area to consider. Um, but let me get back there. I just got a couple more charts and see if we have any final questions. Railroads. Oh, I didn't do the uh, airlines. Um, airlines, I think, look great to me. Here was the move to the downside. We've gotten a big, big push to the upside. Um, I mentioned this before, um, but airlines, if you pull up the seasonality, this is crazy. Um, but airlines, over the past 18 years, check out October, 94% um, of the time, so I'm going to say 17 in the last 18 years, we have been higher. The average gain just during the month of October, this is not an annualized number, airlines average going up 7.4% during the month of October over the last 18 years. And if you think that's good, well, November and December tend to just tack on more gains. So the fourth quarter is very strong for this group. And if I go back and I show you, we pull up that chart again, look at what just happened in October. And we were in a downtrend, then magically, everything looks good. MACD is all of a sudden back above centerline resistance. Uh, so now we're seeing bullish momentum again. Um, and this is an area right in here, gap resistance, that looks like we may have just cleared. On, well, no, actually, we closed at the high there. So we're, we're challenging a really key gap resistance level. I'd like to see airlines pull back and maybe test this rising 20-day moving average. So again, it's not one I'm going to chase, but this is a nice looking group. Um, railroads, this one requires that long-term weekly chart. But um, you can see we went down for a while, came all the way back, and we have just broken out above the double top at 1,600. So I think railroads look very interesting at this level. Truckers, and notice airlines, railroads, truckers. Transports, transports look really nice to me. Truckers pulled back, but again, if you look at the weekly chart, they had a negative divergence. Um, actually, it didn't even have a negative divergence. I thought they had a negative divergence, but they did pull back to about 575. And if you look back, there was your double top at 575, came right back to that support zone, and now I've just blasted off again. 
too overbought to be jumping in at this point, but a pullback to test this breakout near 650 and that rising 20-week moving average would be a great entry point into this space, in my view. Transportation services, um, really nice move here. Uh, we do have a little bit of a negative divergence, and there's a bearish engulfing candle. So we might be looking for a little bit of consolidation in this group for a while. Um, the breakout, though, occurred down around 265, maybe between 263 and 265. So another trip down there, you might get a 50-day uh, test with that negative divergence, maybe reset your MACD. But this is a nice-looking group. It's just a little ahead of itself right now. The uh, XLY Auto Parts, a uh, really nice-looking group. And actually, I wrote about this in the Don't Ignore This chart probably about six weeks ago because it was this breakout on a weekly chart that really caught my attention. Look at this sideways three-year, two-and-a-half-year consolidation before we made this breakout above the 480, 490 area. So this is after long consolidation. I think this uptrend is just beginning. But again, you want to try and get it on a pullback. So it's one that I'm watching really closely. Automobiles, same thing. Move up, bull flag, another breakout, move up. I think we're just consolidating um, another strong group. The uh, specialty retailers broke out above the 1120 area, came right back down to test it. And this is interesting because retail has been so weak, but the specialty retailers have actually started to strengthen and look pretty good on the weekly chart as well. After consolidating for two and a half years, just made a big breakout. So this is a group that I would really be paying attention to as well. Uh, restaurants and bars, you can see on the daily chart, you know, what could I possibly like? Well, I do like this move that we've made over the last week and a half. But more importantly, on the weekly chart, this looks like maybe the right side of a cup. Uh, beautiful uptrend. We went, we came down. We were way overbought. That's why I don't like to chase. We had an RS weekly RSI in the mid 80s. Don't see that very often, especially on an on an index. Um, but we pulled all the way back, consolidated around the 20 week moving average, and now we're just starting to turn back up. I look for a continued move up to test that high that we saw back in late May, early June. And uh, asset managers in the financial space, I like this move to the upside in the asset managers. If we go to a weekly chart, you will see that uh, we really just broke out above 190 um, back in uh, summer months, back in June, came back down, tested 190 and broke out again. So I think on the daily, or excuse me, on the weekly chart, I love these uh, rising 20 week moving average tests that have held. So this one looks really good to me, just need a pullback there. And actually, investment services, we're getting a little bit of a pullback off of a nice rally. Um, this is a group that I also favor, and it would help to see the uh, interest rates, that 10-year treasury yield make the breakout. Uh, this group tends to perform well, like the banks, like life insurance, like asset managers, when we see uh, money moving uh, away from treasuries. So here is a, you know, a nice breakout above the 2015 high, some consolidation, maybe a little cup, handle, and a breakout. So I'm looking for this group to continue to strengthen as well. Uh, the last one I had is the biotech group. Um, and this was a breakout here at about 1970. The big breakout actually occurred uh, back here from the high in March. And if we look at the weekly chart on the index, you will see that uh, after selling off for a period of time, we really struggled to get through 1800. Finally did it, a great looking candle, huge volume to support it. And now look at these 20 week moving average tests. Well, one in particular here where we pulled back, tested that 20 and also held above price support. Now we break out again. So these are some of the areas that I would really be focusing on. Um, and as I showed you, and I could go in, you know, and show you one more time, but on the biotechs, for instance, I'll just do what I did before. Let's just go into the industry group. This shows you all the industry groups for all of the sectors. Scroll down to healthcare. Here is your biotech. And again, if I click on that, there are a ton of biotech companies. So I would recommend hitting the scooter or doing something else. But you can find uh, the best looking um, biotechs based on scooter rank anyway, uh, right here. Now you might want to scroll down. Some of these are really small cap and are performing awesome. great. Yeah, Tom, if you type LRG in the search at the top, that'll just show you the large. Oh, okay. There you go. And uh, then you can weed it out if you don't want some of those smaller. Uh, but if you want the smaller ones, hey. <laughs> yeah, some do. Some do, absolutely. But that's um, one way just to weed it out if you need to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so then you can start from here. Look at the high scooter ranks. 
Um, you could also, you know, switch it here to the one month because we have been consolidating in this group. So you can take a look at some of these, maybe that uh, insight. And this one actually is interesting, not so much for the chart. I'm going to show you the chart. I mean, you can see it's been, you know, moving down. It's below the 20 day and it's struggling. But if it actually gets back up above the 20 day because it is in a good group, I might be interested. And I'm going to just show you to close up here to wrap up the uh, seasonality chart on INCY going back as far as I can go, which I think is 20 years here. Yeah, but you can see October, November, and December. Look at November and December. Average gains of 8.5% in November, 9.6% in December, and 7.1% in January. This is over 20 years, averaging those three in th three consecutive months. So I'm looking for anything technical that shows a breakout in INCY as we approach that November through January period. And again, I'll go back and look at that chart. And you see, you know, we've been struggling, but this could be setting up an opportunity based on seasonality. If we look at the weekly chart, it doesn't look nearly as bad. I mean, we got an uptrend, consolidation, uptrend, consolidation, uptrend, consolidation. We could be ready for another move to the upside. So this is one that actually it's a large cap biotech that, uh, you know, I'll be watching to see if we can get a, a something to show technically on a daily chart, some kind of a breakout. But I'm really watching this 20 day moving average as an initial push to the upside. So, so Tom, on this insight chart, uh, you know, the weekly looks, somebody was asking what would be your perfect pullback? And we know, and the, the, the user does say that, you know, we can't expect perfection in the stock market, but you know, that looks like a pretty darn good pullback there in insight because it's fairly orderly. Uh, you know, it's gone on a few months, but it's just retraced a small portion of the uh, prior advance. So that's a pretty good looking pullback. Yeah, it's a good pullback. And there are a couple of things here. Number one, I've just put in this line at RSI 40. And during uptrends, and I know you follow this as well, Arthur, but if you get a RSI uh, 40 reading during an uptrend, that normally is um, a pretty decent pullback. And you can see with the exception of the first couple months of 2016, throughout this uptrend, anytime We've seen this weekly RSI hit 40. We pretty much have hit bottoms um, going across here. Here was a 40. There's a bottom. Um, we just hit 40. So that is one thing that I would consider. The other thing I would consider is we've got some pretty nice gap support right here where we had gapped up back in early January, moved higher. And as we've pulled back, we've we found some, you know, we've got a little, we've got a piercing candle here that I think establishes some pretty good support right at that gap support. I don't know. I could make some. I could make some arguments here, but I'd like to see something confirm on the daily chart to start to turn more bullish. I would really like to see uh, volume pick up and move back above that declining twenty-day moving average. That, to me, would be the first sign that uh, potentially we could be seeing a reversal. And knowing again that November, December, and January are so strong for this stock, uh, that would be enough to at least give me, you know, reason to to think about taking a chance and going long. Well, that's a great way you set it up because you're using the weekly to set your trading bias, which is the longer trend, right. basically. And now you're honing in on the daily for some sort of upside catalyst. Um, yeah. And I think right here, this is that uh, gap that I was talking about right back in January. Yeah. Check this out. Right to the gap support. Um, the top of the gap had held for quite some time. This is where the pullback was here. And actually back in here, you can see all the, the tails uh, threatening a breakdown to go back to the bottom of the gap support, but we never did it. This actually ended up filling the gap. So you could keep a fairly tight stop, I think, on this one, uh, considering what it normally does going forward. And I'm not, I'm not trying to recommend stocks to anyone. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not a registered investment advisor. So, you know, and everybody's got their own you know, personal financial goals and so forth. And I certainly wouldn't know everybody's, but this is something that for me is at least um, noteworthy, you know, and from an educational perspective, I think it's something that you can look at and consider and see if it fits your own um, investing strategy and so forth. But yeah, I mean, I like what I'm seeing. I, I think that the fact this thing has pulled back so, so much and it's in a, in a strong group, I, I'm still really bullish biotechs. So I think the group's going to go up. And if you know that you've got the tailwinds, the historical tailwinds um, in your favor, 
you've got a long-term uptrend on the weekly chart in your favor, then yeah, I'm looking at the daily chart to try and find entry. So, so this is about a nine month chart and the scale extends from 100 to 150. So that kind of gives you an idea that this is a fairly volatile stock. Yes. Uh, so that's what Tom is saying, you know, see if it fits in with, you know, your portfolio, your style. Yeah. But I thought it was interesting. You know, I don't own it by the way. I'll, if I talk about an individual stock and I own it, I'll tell you. Um, but I think that's uh, about what I had. So I don't know if we have any other questions um, that I haven't addressed or did you have any other questions? Arthur, were you looking at? I don't have any questions. Um, one person's asking if you use the 20 day EMA as kind of your line in the sand all the time uh, for an upside crossover as a buy signal, so to speak, and a back down as a sell signal, or you're looking at other things as well. Um, I use the 20 day moving average a lot. Well, 20 period moving average, depending on what uh, period I'm looking at. But I, I use the 20 period moving average a lot in connection with the MACD. When I've got a MACD that's above the center line, especially when it's moving higher, you know, when you, you move up to highs and then you move up to another high, I'm generally looking for these tests of the 20 day, um, you know, some consolidation. I don't like to buy stocks when I've got the RSI at 70 or above. Um, that normally is indicative of a, a recent push to the upside. And I'm not really interested in getting involved at that level. I mean, you can see here when it gets up above 70, it tops for a while, comes back down. Uh, here it hits 70 right here. So if you're looking at a lot of these stocks and, you, and you're chasing and you're waiting until the stock goes up seven, eight, 10 days in a row, and you look down, you see the RSI at 70 and you, you, know, you want to get into this stock and you finally just say, I, I just can't take it anymore. I'm just going to jump in. That's why a lot of times these stocks will reverse about the time you get in. Um, just because they're so overbought and they just need a pullback. But you can see when it pulls back here, it comes right back down to support level. Um, you know, and, and while the 2017 chart on Insight doesn't show an uptrend, again, that bigger picture long-term chart does show an uptrend. But yeah, I, I use the 20 day a lot as a stop. I prefer to use price support. And if I can get the two of them to line up exactly together, that's when I feel really good about getting in from a reward to risk standpoint, because I've got both, uh, you know, anyone who's looking to buy on a 20 period moving average, they're going to be buying at that level. Then if you're looking at some, you know, there's a group of people who like to buy price support. So if they're buying at that level, that's another group of buyers. And if it happens to be sitting on a trend line, well, there's another group of buyers that might be looking at the trend lines and buying. And I don't know if you have a, a sense of this, Arthur, or not, but the last time I heard um, about 40 to 45% of the volume is generally attributable to those who are following technical analysis as opposed to fundamental. I don't know if that number's changed or if you're familiar with that or if there have been any estimates that you've seen. No, I'm not familiar with uh, that study. Yeah, so, so it's just, um, you know, and that's the beauty with technical analysis is that a lot of times you can predict what others are going to do. And I think if you have multiple reasons, multiple technical reasons to get in. And that just happens to be supported by some of the seasonality that you get here. You know, you can find at stock charts. To me, it just gives me a lot more confidence for the trade. Um, but I'm still going to keep my stop in play. So uh, one more question, Tom, would you use earnings uh, as a catalyst for a signal? Like say, if there's a good reaction to an earnings report and it triggers a buy signal, would you act on that? Um, well, first of all, I have a folder, uh, that I call strong earnings and, um, I need to update it. But, uh, if I pull this up and view all, I can show it in summary form, but I've got over 200 stocks in here and I can rank them by scooter. These are all companies that reported strong they beat Wall Street estimates on the top line. They beat Wall Street estimates on the bottom line. And technically, I like the charts. Doesn't mean necessarily that they gapped up with earnings. It could have already been in an uptrend prior to earnings. And then it just came out. And, you know, it's kind of a buy on the rumor, sell on the news thing where we then pull back. But as long as the overall pattern looks good, these are the kinds of stocks. I'm going to pull up SGMS. This was one. I love these kinds of candles. Um, but you can see SGMS here back in July. This was earnings. 
And so we are sideways consolidating, made a huge move. Check out the 20 day moving average when we pull back and hit that 20 day moving average, how we bounce right back off of it. Um, that's kind of the way that I use. I, I trade almost all stocks from that strong earnings chart list that I have. I would say 80 to or probably 90 to 95 percent of my stocks come out of that list. And I love to see the gap ups. Um, and by the way, we're going to have a session on Monday, the Market Watchers Live. I'm going to do a segment talking about uh, trading gaps, uh, gap trading strategies. And so uh, if you're interested in that, I would suggest uh, that you take a look. And if you can't come in during the day when we do that, uh, we do ho um, have a recording available until Wednesday. So you have a couple days to look at that. But um, yeah, I absolutely use these earnings gap ups as a catalyst to potentially trade. Now, when I see this, I'm not jumping in after I see the big gap up and the move higher. I wait. I just put it into a folder and I'm waiting on pullbacks. I love to get these RSIs between 40 and 50. I love to get the rising 20 day tests. I like to get price support, gap support tests and so forth. Okay. Very good answer. All right. I think that's probably about it. I know we went a little bit over, but uh, you and I, we, you know, we love doing this stuff. Absolutely. Uh, we could talk charts all day. I know. We got football to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, my, my football game doesn't start until later today. So I, I literally could sit here for a while, but uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to force myself. I'm going to wean myself away from the chart. <laughs> I'm off. I know you, You'll be you back know. on Monday. Yes, I will be back on Monday. And by the way, you know, if you like listening to all of uh, Arthur's stuff, he has Arch Charts, which is behind the paywall. But if you become a member, I'm, there is so much information on this website um, for members. I mean, there's a lot of information for non-members, a lot of commentary and so forth. But um, to actually be able to, to use the chart list and run scans against them and be able to get commentary from Arthur and Martin and John Murphy, um, it is absolutely invaluable. And so if you're not already a member, you should certainly think about it. There's a 30-day free trial. Uh, I have no idea why you wouldn't want to do that. Um, I do want to just stress, if you haven't already, um, Arthur writes on Chart Watchers. I write on our, uh, Chart Watchers and a few others here at Stock Charts do as well. But if you go into the blogs page, all I did was clicked on blogs. And if you scroll down right here, if you're not a member and you haven't already signed up for Chart Watchers, I have no idea what you're waiting on uh, because there are some great information and this is a free newsletter. Type John in your email. contributes. Absolutely. It's crazy. Um, you know, and I, I've said before, I'm pretty much self taught, but I did um, read John Murphy. I consider John Murphy like my mentor. Um, and when I met him for the first time back in 2011, I mean, I, you know, you'd have thought I was meeting the Pope um, or something. I mean, it was, I was so excited to meet John Murphy because I'd followed his work. I read his books. I've incorporated a lot of the ratio analysis and the way he looks at the different asset classes and looks at different uh, markets around the world and all. I mean, it's fascinating to me and it makes just perfect sense. Um, and he writes in a way that you can understand it. You know, I've, I've read books before where it's like, I, you know, you got to go back and read the paragraph four times. Um, but he, he has a way of simplifying. And so, yeah, I mean, you, you sign up for Chart Watchers and you're going to get John Murphy, you're going to get Martin Pring, you're going to get Arthur, uh, you'll get me, Greg Schnell, some others. I mean, it's just a, a great piece. It comes out twice a month, first and third Saturdays of the month and uh, keeps you up to date, um, you know, and, and managing your portfolio. Um, you know, the one thing I will say about, you know, if your, if your portfolio goes up, I can't say, I can't speak for you, Arthur, but if someone's that's listening to us right now, if their portfolio goes up, I don't get a cut out of that. I'm pretty sure you don't either. Um, no. <laughs> we're interested in just helping, you know, when you go with a money manager and there are some excellent money managers out there, I'm not going to say anything bad, but they are getting compensated based on your assets or their, you know, sometimes their performance. Um, I, we don't have anything at stake as far as that goes. It's just, you know, we're trying to give you information that we think is really uh, worthy of your attention and trying to manage your, your uh, portfolio, or maybe it's your, your, your child or your grandchild's uh, college education fund or whatever it is. But anyhow, you know, we do a lot. We do a lot of these blogs. We do a lot of the, these live shows, um, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, Aaron Swenlin and I host Market Watchers Live. You know, if you're available during the day, check that out. If you're not available during the day, you've got the recording. 
And uh, Arthur, again, does his arts charts. Um, and uh, Arthur and I, along with Greg Schnell, do, we do uh, Don't Ignore This Chart um, blog as well. So there's just a ton of information here at the website. And I hope you all do get a chance to uh, maximize the benefit from all of this uh, that we try to do. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up, Arthur. I really appreciate you coming in and uh, subbing for Greg Schnell. It was a great um, session. We'll definitely have you back uh, again in the future. But uh, thanks, my friend. Absolutely. Happy to do it. Uh, always good to chat with you, Tom, on stocks. I uh, just wish we could do it live over a beer next time. <laughs> you know, the one thing I've noticed when you and I get together is there is a lot of overlap because you and I, more than anyone else at the at stock charts, at least from my perspective, you know, when I look at everyone else's style and everybody you know, has got their own style and everybody that trades out there, everybody listening to us today, everybody has their own style. But I'd have to say that, you know, your style and my style tend to be the closest. We're the pullback players. We are. We are the pullback. That's a good way to <laughs> that's a good way to summarize it. We're the we're the pullback players. You know, everybody else is getting that momentum and it's turning up and they're, you know, going after stocks a lot of times after they've made a little bit of a move. But I, I would say that, you know, you and I do tend to uh, look at the pullback and the price support and the trend lines and those sort of things. But anyway, I hear you. I hear you. I look at your charts and I say, I can relate to that. <laughs> it's always a, a pleasure doing these with you. So thanks again, Arthur. Okay, Tom. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks everybody out there. We do these uh, uh, stock charts outlook live webinars once a month. So mark your calendar. It's usually the second Saturday of the month, unless we have a scheduling conflict. So I do believe Greg Schnell will be back next month. And Greg, of course, he, he does, you know, he has his own little flavor on trading. He does a lot of work with the commodities, um, very uh, um, adept at looking at the uh, uh, energy space, you know, being in uh, Canada um, just seems to have his uh, finger on the pulse for a lot of the commodities and uh, energy areas. And I know he's turned pretty bullish on some of those. So he'll be back in November for our next Stock Charts Outlook. Uh, and again, Check out Market Watchers Live Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from noon to 12, or excuse me, noon to 1.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So check that out if you can. Um, thanks for stopping in, everybody. Have a great rest of your weekend and happy trading.